It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high-yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Happy you guys could join us. If you have a moment, please review us in iTunes or Stitcher or whatever modality that you're listening to this in. I'd greatly appreciate it. Today, we're going to discuss shoulder RFA, which is something I personally am just starting to dabble with. I, have, I don't have any extensive experience with this. Many times, patients will have shoulder pain. They don't, if they don't respond to the injections, I would do a peripheral nerve stimulator, which has been helping quite a bit. But I know some of you guys out there are doing RFA ablations of the shoulder joint, which I feel is probably trickier than the knee. So Azra has a nice newsletter, it's from 2020, that goes over the technique, and um, it, uh, it gives a nice overview, and I suggest you read it. I'll have the link in the show notes. So they discuss, they start by talking about Hilton's law of joint innervation, which has been validated and has stood since the, te- since the test of time, or since 1863, basically predicts potential nerve supply to the joint of a, of a shoulder, for example, accompanies the muscle innervation. Both thermal and pulsed RFA of the suprascapular have been described to treat chronic shoulder pain, and there's a theoretical concern of post-ablation weakness in the supra and infraspinatus muscles. Ekman described the articular innervation of the glenohumeral joint for future techniques in joint denervation via ablation. Distal articular sensory denervation can reduce the chance of post-ablation motor weakness. Successful shoulder articular sensory denervation using RFA has been described in literature. So far, the four nerves that innervate the glenohumeral joint and subdeltoid bursa are the suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, nerve to subscapularis, and occasionally lateral pectoral nerve. Of note, the lateral pectoral nerve provides innervation to the AC joint and associated corticochromial clavicular and corticohumeral ligaments. The safe zone for ablation has been defined as the area lateral to the spinal glenoid notch posteriorly, suprascapular branches at the uh, inferior posterior portion of the greater tubercle, which are the axillary branches, and over the coracoid process for the lateral pectoral branches. And the safe zones are depicted in the figure that they have on their um, review here. The loud trunk of the suprascapular nerve could also be ablated, which may spare supraspinatus function but compromise infraspinatus function. Midway between the suprascapular notch and the spinal glenoid notch of the supraspinous fossa, that's where it's located. The nerve to subscapular should be accessible over the anterior superior neck of the glenoid. However, due to proximity of this nerve to the brachial plexus and axillary artery, Preclinical and clinical work on determining ideal ablation trajectory is ongoing by his team. Um, as with the knee and hip, uh, the shoulder articular uh, ablation is a compromise between full joint denervation and safety. The inferior portion of the glenohumeral joint anteriorly and posteriorly is unacceptably close to the motor portion of the axillary nerve, nerves and brachial plexus, so, don't, so stay away from that. It's uh, too proximate to the circumflex humeral artery to be considered for ablation only for palliative circumstances. So they're giving us um, some pictures here. I I suggest you take a look at them yourself so you uh, can see what they consider the safe zones for ablation. Now, for selecting uh, the proper patients for this, um, you want to have patients with clinical evidence of symptomatic osteoarthritis, chronic shoulder pain, suspected peripheral origin, not of central origin. Ablation of articular sensory nerves to the shoulder most likely has efficacy for pain originating from the joint capsule and nearby ligaments or nerves themselves. However, denervation can diminish sensory input 
from rotator cuff injuries. It, that's an unclear thing, so it, they're not really sure about that. But some patients with primary ro rotator cuff disease have responded to ablation, and they cite a reference for that. The role of ablation for treating chronic pain after total shoulder arthroplasty also requires further study. Some patients uh, did not uh, did respond well. Excuse me. Diagnostic nerve blocks should be performed in any patient who's going for ablation. This is standard with other techniques. They want 50% pain relief here, whereas um, CMS requires 80% for RFA of the medial branch nerves. Here they're suggesting 50%, which is pretty low, but I think it's acceptable. And they do need to do more studies to really confirm the best approach, the best uh, percentage to use, et cetera. In terms of in articular injections, um, being for the diagnostic power, well, it may not be very consistent here. They've seen with RFA facet joints that it may not have um, uh, 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 the best prognostic value for RFA success. Nerve selection should follow zone of pain per per perception. Deep posterior lateral pain would suggest that the suprascapular and axillary nerve should be targeted. Anterior pain may suggest the lateral pectoral nerve and nerve to subscapularis should be targeted. Safety considerations for both diagnostic locks and RFA are common. Um, this is a low uh, but possible risk of vascular nerve plexus injury and joint infection. Be cautious in patients who have uh, cardiac devices, AICDs, et cetera, when you're doing the RFA. And for the diagnostic approach, they're using fluoroscopy here. And what they're doing is, um, in the first image, they're going to the suprascapular articular ablation zone, which is lateral to the spinal glenoid notch and medial to the joint space. The axillary articular ablation zone is inferior to the portion of the greater tubercle, and you might need to um, reposition a few times to get here. There's a nice picture of their targets. I suggest you look at this. Now, for the lateral pectoral nerve, ablation zone overlies the centroid or neck of the coracoid process. Nerve to subscapularis can be ablated on the superior glenoid neck, medial to the joint line, superior and lateral to the coracoid process, and do not pass inferior and deep to the coracoid process. You don't want to wind up in the axilla. That could be a whole world of headache and pain. There's alternative uh, approaches. Um, you could have a partial lateral position, and there's a picture um, uh, of how the patient could be placed so you could access both the anterior and posterior aspects of the nerve. So um, I think you guys should read this. Uh, I'm not a person who does a lot of these, so I'm probably not the best person to coach you through it. I'm going to learn from talking to my colleagues who do a lot of these as well as reading these articles, and um, I hope that this will provide value for you. In terms of post-procedure care, do a motor exam after the procedure to make sure that there's no weakness, and if there is weakness, it may be related to just a local anesthetic use prior to lesioning. However, still, um, it is cause for concern and observe that patient. A passive range of motion exercises should be initiated after treatment. Patients should be referred to PT for evaluation. Active range of motion exercise can be initiated as tolerated within two to four weeks following the procedure. Improved range of motion after shoulder nerve ablation has been demonstrated. Patients should, should um, inform their physician of any new pains or nerve deficits. And it could take two to four weeks for patients to see a long-term benefit to occur. Um, and there may be post-operative pain as there typically is radio frequency procedures. I hope this was helpful. Um, I plan to do a lot more um, uh, to start doing these or do more of them and maybe have some more educational content for you. Hope to see you guys online or in person. We have the workshops coming up and the ultrasound courses, a few of them, as well as the regenerative medicine courses, do have the Zoom option available where you can get CME credits as well as the replay and um, watch from your home if you can't make it to New York or any of the other cities I'm going to be at. Hope to see you guys in Miami in February for my ultrasound course, as well as uh, West Virginia in April. Check out the nrappain.org website or painexam.com slash events, and I'll see you there. Thanks again for listening. Take care.
Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate, and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.